Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Flawed Theology Podcast. I'm Phil. And I'm Susie. And we're asking the question, if your theology were wrong, wouldn't you want to know? All right. So today we've got uh, an interesting, unique experience uh, for everybody, hopefully. And this is actually going to be the last episode before we take a little break for the summer, just because with vacations and chaotic sports schedules with children and stuff like that, um, we're going to take a a couple months off during the summer and then we'll come back in the fall. So this is, we thought, a cool way to kind of end this section of the season. So it's been fun, but we thought we were going to have a little roundtable discussion with a couple different people from the Facebook. Facebook group, which is Dangerous Questions, by the way, to kind of talk about their deconversion stories, but about the conversation that we may or may not have had with our friends and family about our own faith journey. So like one of the most challenging aspects, I think, about deconversion is how do you broach the subject with your still believing parents or your still believing friends? And most of us or many of us might have come from Christian households and our families are still Christian. And it might take us a while to get to the point of sharing that thing. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the anxiety (laughs) around that, how we decided to tell our families or maybe to not tell our families if that was what we decided what we was best for us. We've got some guests and I'm excited to have a bunch of people here today. So I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves. We'll start. Well, actually, I'll say who they are first, and then we'll go around and introduce so people aren't like, well, who the hell's talking? So um, we have uh, Brianne. She is coming to us from tomorrow. Another person from the future because <laughs> she's in she's in Japan. So it's Friday morning. And then we have uh, Mika, who is here in the present with us. And then Lars, who has been on the show before. And we're excited to have Lars back as well. And of course, Susie's live from the Lord and Taylor stockroom. So, yeah. <laughs> so let's go around and just have you guys introduce yourself. Let's start with Brianne. Sure. So my name is Brianne. Um, I'm currently living in northern Japan, but I grew up in the Midwest in Nebraska. Was there like my whole life, went to college there. Uh, My spouse is in the military. So that is why we are over in Japan at the moment. And that kind of relates to my deconstruction story, I suppose. But I grew up much like Susie, Missouri Synod Lutheran. We had like a fun quip of how, you know, Missouri Synods clearly lead to deconstruction, maybe. Oh, Um, cool. (laughs) I didn't know that. Yeah. So I grew up Missouri Synod Lutheran, went to church just kind of with my mom and my parents. Once I got into high school, she switched to an Assemblies of God church, which is a more like Pentecostal vibe. Um, So I attended a small church in high school and then went to college um, away from home and continued attending like a more what I thought was like a progressive, cool Christian, kind of like how Phil described like, you know, oh, yeah, these are like the good, cool, progressive Christians that I'm now a part of. Um, And I played keys in the worship band there for a couple of years. And now I have deconstructed. Um, I'm in my late 20s and I deconstructed probably five to a couple years ago and now would identify as an atheist. Very cool. That's a cool story. I I always find it interesting when there's like synergy between people's stories too. Like you got the Lutheran connection. Like I was in worship bands. You were in worship bands. That's pretty cool. Well, thanks for being here today. And let's go to Mika. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Thank you. I'm really glad to be on here. Um, I was born and raised in North Carolina, and I've lived here my entire life. I'm a Charlotte girl. I now live in the country in the foothills and um, live in an old farmhouse with my teenagers. So I would say that my Christian upbringing was by two parents who got saved during the first Pentecostal movement in the 70s. So they were young and hip, and Christianity was young and hip and being presented like that to them. And they got involved in some non-denominational churches. They joined Calvary in Charlotte, which ended up becoming a mega church, one of the first mega churches, especially in our region. You can look it up, and it's a hideous pink stuccoed crown. Uh, <laughs> I, know exactly what, I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, so I know every inch of that place, and I probably made out with boys in every hidden nook there. Well played. While I was a Christian and a good girl, I had a split side to me. And there was a, a large part of me that just went into deep hiding during my entire experience of being a Christian. So my parents' beliefs got stranger and stranger and less mainstream as the years went by. And I was raised to think of myself as a living sacrifice to Jehovah. My parents kind of had a cult of two, (laughs) and they were quite odd by the end of my mom's life. So 
And I have a lot of training in sacred choral music. So that is part of my spiritual experience. I, when people say they do breath work, I say, me too. I've done a <laughs> hell of a lot of breath work. <laughs> and so I incorporate that into my current experience as a seeker and mystic. I deconverted, finished in 2020 and met a whole lot of cool people online. Uh, many of them I still consider good friends. And uh, the ex-Christian community has been a wonderful experience for me as I learned how to be a good friend, how to be empathetic without pushing anything onto anyone. I got a lot of lessons in that very fast. So I'm just glad to be here. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. Well, that's un- more synergy. So my wife is from Charlotte and then I was in Calvary Chapel for like eight to 10 years. So familiar with that thing too. So hmm. yeah, thanks for being here. We're excited to to have you here. So Lars, welcome back, sir. Tell us a little about a bit about yourself. Oh, thank you. Um, I've been here before, so I don't need to go over my entire life story. Uh, you can hear it on or some of it anyway on the last time I was here. To cut a long story short, if you don't want to go listen to a long one, I was raised in the Plymouth Brethren sect of Christians. They're very fundamentalist, not strictly organized denomination. The thing that really got me to start deconstructing my beliefs was realizing that evolution is true. And to any of you who've taken biology, that seems like a no-duh kind of moment. But <laughs> if you haven't and have been told all your life that not only is evolution false, but it's a lie from the devil meant to steal your soul... <laughs> Uh, finding out that it's actually true um, is kind of a shock. And it was enough that it got me to start re-examining all the other beliefs that I had. Um, I wanted to make sure that I didn't get duped again by stupid nonsense like creationism. <laughs> so I got to studying science and especially the philosophy of science and epistemology, epistemology being the study and understanding of knowledge or how you know things are true. Once I did that, as anyone else who has done something similar can testify, the beliefs of Christianity quickly fall by the wayside as something you can't support as true at the very best or are outright false at the worst. And so I have to acknowledge that I don't consider myself a Christian anymore and that I consider myself an atheist of the rather hard variety, if you will. I claim to know that there are no gods, not with total certainty, because I don't think that's possible for just about anything, but to the same extent that I know there are no fairies, Bigfoot, Loch Ness monsters, or any of the other gods that everyone else already agrees are just mythology. Awesome. Well, I think that's awesome to hear everybody's story. They're all like different, different angles. And I think it's always fascinating to hear what the triggering thing was to have you change your whole faith. We probably all had these discussions with people where people say, oh, deconversion and deconstruction. It's just it's just a trend. It's a fad. It's something that's cool. I mean, I think there's some pastor where he said deconstruction is sexy. And anyone who's <laughs> truly deconstructed would be like, uh, pardon me, like there's nothing fucking sexy about this. Brianne, you have a thought on this? <laughs> you know, 2020 was a really big like, hey, maybe what I'm believing isn't the right course of action. But then also, you know, I I personally, you know, got a STEM degree, like I have a bachelor's in a science. And so I even have a memory of being in college in a psychology class and they were explaining how it was, you know, how these psychological things are evolutionary. And at the end of the class, the teacher wanted us to write Um, a statement of what we took from the class and how that relates to our personal beliefs, whatever those beliefs may be, like how this class has influenced that. And I remember writing like, hey, I may not agree with (laughs) this, 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 but I understand this, but I still have like a solid belief in a God, like and specifically a Christian God. And that like looking back, I cringe like at that moment, I had all the tools available to me and then just didn't. But my politics and what I was, how I was experiencing the world and my beliefs about the world directly led to why I knew that Christianity maybe wasn't it, I guess. Yeah. Like, and just that trigger of, oh, it all kind of starts like coming together once you hit a certain point. Yeah. If anyone listened to the Alex episode, uh, the Mormons have a ex Mormons have a thing called the shelf where they basically put all the inconsistencies, all the things that they don't quite understand in Mormonism, and they just kind of put them on a shelf. And then in the ex-Mormon community, they refer to that shelf breaking when the last thing <laughs> goes on that shelf and the whole thing comes tumbling down. So, Brianne, you said your what would you say was your last item kind of on your shelf that kind of broke your shelf? Um, I think it was a combination of... Like, I have never had the desire to be a parent. And as a woman approaching 30, that becomes like a huge thing and like, you know, atypical of society. Seeing that and then having it reinforced through Christian circles of like, 
oh, you're married, but you don't have a child or, oh, you're 25 and you don't have a child. Like that was like the societal pressure. So that was kind of always there, like as the heavier weight. And then I think like with a lot of deconversion stories, 2020 really kind of hit the nail on the head, I think in more ways than one of, hey, there's a global pandemic and what I have interpreted Jesus to be is loving and caring and I should care for my neighbor. And then I saw the same people that would preach those things not want to wear a mask or just be blatantly against anything that would help their fellow human. And that was kind of like a big wake up call for me. And then with all of the other things that I maybe put on my shelf growing up, um, because I I, listening to that episode, I related to that quite a bit of I have these things that I don't really get, but I'll just put them on the shelf and deal with them later. It just all kind of came with 2020 and seeing like, hey, maybe this can allow me to at least question my beliefs. And I think that's the biggest thing is wanting to ask the question, can I be wrong? Right. Mika, what about you? What was the what was the last straw? Well, I want to say that my relationship with the God of Christianity was very transactional. It was not based on my emotions. It was not based on any experiences that I had that were spiritual. It was just a uh, do this or you're going to go to hell. <laughs> This is how we have to act if we don't want to go to hell. And it was very cold and calculated and, dare I say, white. The experience of being a Christian at a mega church in Charlotte, North Carolina, was a totally white experience. There was no hands in the air. There was no hooting and hollering. <laughs> there was none of that emotional stuff. And in fact, when I got around people that acted like that, I was like, Ugh, they have no class. I was extremely judgmental. Because in my mind, it was all about the deal. And when I saw my dad, who had raised me in that, you know, to kind of regard the divine as being transactional, and I saw him become determined and vocal about his decision to support Trump, I realized I'm the only one upholding these damn ideals here. (laughs) I'm the only one in my family that even gives a shit about them. So that really gave a lot of gas to my deconversion experience. And it just kind of, and plus at the time, I took a job and started training to be a fraud examiner and I'm a certified fraud examiner. And that really helped me a lot too. I'm like, oh, I can pull the string. <laughs> so I started pulling a lot of strings after that. And it well, started cool. really, really fast, just like that sweater and the Weezer song. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting how both of you mentioned the Christian response to COVID and Trump is kind of intertwined in that. Christians seem to think that Trump is like ordained by God or that he was sent by God. But yet there's so many people, not just you guys, but so many people who were driven away from Christianity because of Trump. And I just think that's really ironic that why would God send Trump here if he's going to just cause this cause this mass exodus from Christianity? (laughs) Real good foreknowledge there. God, fuck that one up. Well, I'm I'm going to tell you that as it shrinks in size, it becomes more nasty. And that's kind of how all authoritarianism works. It gets smaller and nastier and starts eating. They start eating each other Mm -hmm. and they starting on each other. That's how it always ends. Yeah. I feel like they're backed up against a wall and they're, yeah, the numbers are so dwindling. They're getting more defensive and starting to attack a little. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lars, what's your, uh, what was your, your final thing on the shelf? The final thing was just uh, acknowledging to myself after several years that I didn't believe anymore. You know, but the, that acknowledgement came on June 29th, 2021, because um, a, a friend of mine had messaged me and asked, you know, hey, where do you stand on matters of faith these days? And I, I realized I had to talk to my wife about this before I gave him an answer. So I did. Turns out she'd been right there along with me and was just looking for the opportunity to ask me how I felt about it too. So that was pretty great. Uh, not everyone has such a happy experience deconverting with members of their family who were also Christian, especially a spouse, right? But what I was going to say is that for me, the Trump thing was just further confirmation that whatever led to those kinds of political ideas, it couldn't be good. And if Christianity is supposed to be good, then either it wasn't Christianity or Christianity wasn't good. <laughs> well, I think you all know which end <laughs> of that dilemma uh, I fell on. Yeah. Oh, actually, I would argue that in, in some senses it's both because there have obviously been kinder versions of Christianity throughout history and even today, but they tend to get that way at the expense of what are generally considered core creedal doctrines. Right. Have y'all ever listened to Brad Onishi? Yes, Yes, a few times. When he says religion is what its adherents do, Mm -hmm. that is enough to stop any argument from anyone who tells me that such and such is not true Christianity. It is just an Mm -hmm. argument 
proper. Yeah. Religions change just like languages do. Yeah. You can't control them. Mm-hmm. I mean, those people are basically saying that to be Christian equals to be equals being moral. Well, it doesn't. Um, <laughs> you know, Clearly not. It's... Clearly not. <laughs> I got a few crusades. I'd like to argue about that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, crusades, um, apologetics for slavery, the upholding of things like feudalism or just divine right of rulers. You know, now these are not all exclusive to Christianity. It's just many religions and uh, as they maintain power, do these kinds of things, right? They have slaves, they have downtrodden people, they have sexist policies, and they ordain all these things as being from their God. And so, hey, who cares if you don't like it? We've obviously got the highest authority going for us, and we're just here to enforce that authority. And, and I mean, you even see it in the Bible itself, like the, the tales of conquest, which, by the way, archaeologically speaking, probably didn't actually happen. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, they, they were written as a way to justify the fact that the Israelites are here and the natives didn't like it. Well, tough. Our God says we get this land. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And when you look at it, like from a perspective of the kinds of religions that propagate and survive better, it's going to be those kinds of religions that are violent and have forced conversions and that type of thing. It's not going to be like the religions that focus on love. Right. That's a huge factor in uh, why Christianity was so successful. Yeah, for sure. And I think most people have heard kind of our stories too, but like Susie, maybe refresh people what your kind of final straw was. Oh, okay. Uh, Well, I don't think I've said this on the podcast before, but I have mentioned it in the Facebook group that there was one day I was listening to a few a few episodes of the Counter Apologetics podcast, and it was one where he was talking about what heaven would be like and how we would just be zombie versions of ourselves. That's the only option. Like, that's the only thing that makes sense why we would not miss our loved ones in hell. And that hit me like a truck. I was like, (laughs) oh, man, like, I can't come back from this. And the other thing was that, Brienne, you might find this interesting that he mentioned in a podcast that Martin Luther had written a bunch of anti-Semitic books and he had um, condoned burning down their houses and murdering them. And I was I had never been told that in all of my years at in a Missouri Southern Lutheran church, 30 plus years and confirmation class, nobody had ever told me that. I felt incredibly betrayed by everybody I knew. And I knew at that moment that I could not go back. I would say those things broke the shelf, but they're not the biggest reasons I don't believe. They absolutely broke the shelf. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and I think mine is similar to everybody's a little bit, but the January 6th was the thing that kind of was the no, the no turning back point for me. I mean, I had already been at war like with my own parents who were Trumpers and, you know, told them, how can you support this person who clearly is not a representation of what you say that you believe or what you raised me to believe. And then January 6th happened and you didn't hear any Christians come out and say anything about it. They weren't like, oh, we shouldn't have done that or they shouldn't have done that or that's not the Bible I believe in. But, you know, it's like crickets, you know. So I remember just being in the car and I had the highlights of it going on my phone while I was driving and going, I can't believe in this God anymore. Like, it's just not going to happen. And then the the cementing factor, I, I discovered Bart Ehrman and discovered that the Bible wasn't inerrant. And I was like, oh, well, well, fuck. If people wrote this <laughs> book, I can write a book and maybe get people to believe it. I always find it interesting to hear people's, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. the, the tipping point because everybody is similar, but everybody is different. And I think that's something that you see across the whole spectrum of deconstruction. But so the the main kind of thrust of like what we want to talk about is having the conversation with family and friends about our status as heathens or whatever, as non-believers, as whatever you might classify yourself as, which I think what we classify ourselves as is less important. I think I find it immensely freeing to not really label myself as anything. So let's go around first and kind of talk about, have you had this conversation with your family? And if you have or haven't, or I guess if you have, how long into your deconversion Uh, Did you wait to have that conversation? And then if you haven't had it, hold on to why you haven't shared, but don't tell us all the reasons why um, you haven't shared yet, because we're going to get to that. We'll start with Lars to mix it up, you know, we'll get too ruddy. (laughs) Sure. Um, So as I mentioned, uh, June 29th, 2021 is when I got that email from my friend, uh, Facebook message actually. And uh, so that night I finally talked to my wife. I'd been looking for a way to do this for a while. And I said, hey, 
my friend asked where I stand in matters of faith. And the truth is I just don't have any anymore. And as I said, to my great relief, she said no. And we were at that time planning a camping trip with our kids uh, who were at the time nine, seven and five. Uh, so that, that was just a week out from that. So we figured we'd tell them then. So uh, we did. And it went pretty well. Uh, the oldest one had kind of already figured it out for himself. He's like, oh, that makes sense. Uh, the other, second one uh, had always been the most uh, theological. She's the one who was always asking questions about, you know, so if God is everywhere, does that mean God is in my butt? And <laughs> Yes. Yes, yes, he is. Nice. He's very <laughs> preoccupied with your butt, for sure. We hate that butt stuff. <laughs> and because you know, and, and we'd answered yes because we weren't ready to say, you know, I don't think he's real. Um, <laughs> although she had on her own earlier asked, wait a minute, if magic isn't real and God is magic, then how is God real? Mm-hmm. And you know, we kind of to my shame blown her off a bit with a with a non-answer. Uh and the youngest was just like, Oh, I'm a little scared about that. But yeah, the, the middle one, she was a little upset. But when we explained to her our reasons, she's like, okay, I guess that makes sense too. Um, now, our kids are uh, inquisitive and intelligent. And even though they are pretty good at keeping secrets if we asked them to, we'd rather they didn't have to keep this one, especially if they had to lie about it. Uh, so we knew that we'd have to let our parents, our, both our respective parents know before we saw them again about what was going on. We didn't want to have our kids accidentally spill the beans and be unprepared for a conversation. So uh, we purchased the book Coming Out Atheist by Greta Christina. If you purchase it on Amazon, you can get the audiobook for just $1 extra. No sponsorship from Amazon, just so anybody's wondering. No sponsorship. It's just uh, <laughs> that's how we found it. Um, and it gave us some good ideas, although most of them we'd already come to on our own. So that was kind of cool. So what we decided to do was uh, write a letter and send it in the mail. So that gave us a bunch of time to work on a draft. Uh, we revised it several times. We had a kind of a base letter that we worked from. Then both of us tailored it with our own kind of language to our own parents um, and then sent it in the mail. And we did that for several reasons. One, we wanted to show that we cared a lot, right? That this is not a flippant choice. This is not something that we came to lightly or um, on a whim. And if you send a paper letter in 2021, well, that shows a, a lot of thought must have gone into it, right? You don't just do that for no reason. You had to dig through and find some stamps. Right. And... <laughs> It prevents the opportunity for uh, immediate response. When you hear some emotionally devastating news, which we knew this is going to be, oftentimes you're going to respond in in some sort of way that you'll probably regret later, right? You'll you'll lash out or um, say something you probably didn't really mean, but just felt like it in the moment. And so we wanted to avoid that. They would respond in anger and then we'd respond back in anger. Um, It forced the conversation to go slowly and give them as much time as they wanted to process it before they decided to respond. And all things considered, I think it went rather well. Uh, We've been able to maintain at least cordial relationships with both our sets of parents since then. Although my parents have tried to lure me back to the fold with some (laughs) incredibly bad and insulting apologetics. Yeah, Um, I've seen it. It's bad. (laughs) <laughs> oh, they, yeah, they, especially the, the, the second letter. Um, I won't read yeah. the whole thing, uh, but I can be fairly sure my dad's not going to hear this podcast. But he said, we attempted to instill in you a love for truth, fairness, respect, integrity, love for the living God and for your fellow man, with the implication that I don't have any of those things. Right. <laughs> and the only one of those things that I don't have. <laughs> love of the living God. For what it's worth, because of the kind of Christianity I was raised in, I am now a more moral person now than I ever was or could have been as a Christian because I don't see morality as just a bunch of rules to follow. So when I saw it as a bunch of rules to follow, then it didn't matter to me, for example, if homosexuals wanted to live life with someone who was the same sex. Well, they couldn't because it was against the rules and it was my prerogative to tell them so. They uh, they were wrong. And so it didn't matter how they felt about it because, hey, feelings didn't matter. Right. So this has got me to realize that, hey, if someone is not hurting someone else with their actions and making them feel bad, then feeling good is, hey, one of the best things we've got. We've got happy chemicals that our brain makes. And as long as we can keep doing that without hurting ourselves or others or the planet, then, hey, let's go for it. And so, yeah, I'm a better person now than I was as a Christian. And I have more integrity and more love for my fellow man than I ever did before. And how long... Would you say, did you wait to make that revelation to your parents after your decision let you were clear that you didn't believe anymore? Like how long of time oh, passed? About a month. Oh, okay. Well, that's fast. Well, it, it could, it would have actually been sooner, but um, my dad's birthday is July 23rd. We didn't want to ruin that. And, and my wife's parents were on vacation on a cruise. We didn't want to ruin that. So we waited until both of those things were done before sending out the letter. Okay. Very thoughtful of you. Yeah. Again, we, you know, we knew it's going to cause grief. We wanted to minimize that and also minimize how they would respond to us if we had that. So, yeah, cool. All right. Uh, let's go to Brianne 
have you told your family about it and how long did you wait? Um, so I am 50 50. I'll say, I don't know. And as I continue to meet new people, I think that percentage maybe goes to 60 40, 70 30. But there are people in my life that I have not told, and I can get into those reasons later. Mm -hmm. But I did tell what I would consider like my most important people um, at this stage in my life. And I don't want that to come off as harsh that the other people are not right. <laughs> important. But the first person I told um, was my spouse, who I won't speak for where they're at on their religious journey. They identify as Catholic. But we, it's been a while since we've gone to a church. You know, thank COVID for that, I guess, as well, because mm -hmm. that was another factor of that. I think I had the, and I describe it as a privilege, which is a very nuanced conversation, but I had the privilege of not living with or being in close proximity with these people that I have not told. So I told my spouse because I'm obviously, I'm across the world with them. I do everything with them. I consider them like my ride or die, like in this one life, right? So yeah. I had been going through probably years of buildup, but it was a pretty quick couple months of, oh, can I question being wrong? Can I question if Jesus is God? Can I question, you know, these big things that are, you know, were told to me my whole life that I couldn't question? And that kind of spiraled. So as soon as I knew for sure, like with myself that, hey, I cannot believe this, probably within the next week or two, I like sat down with my spouse and I said, hey, I, this is like really big and I understand if this like causes issues, but I just need to tell you. I don't think I can believe in Christianity. And it has been a positive experience. I have tried not to push them in either direction. They're very open and they took it with what I would say part in the Christian parlance of like so much grace of I see you and you're still like my person and we're going to mm -hmm. get through this life. And however that looks is a little different. And right here and right now, I you know, I'm here for you and do what you got to do. When I meet new people and I would say part of my deconversion was getting active or like meeting new people that did not ascribe to my uh, current religious beliefs. So we had lived in Colorado, which again is away from where I grew up, but I was, you know, being active in my community, finding friends. And, you know, as you get to know people, their religious beliefs comes out and like being able to see happy atheists <laughs> or not even just atheists, but people that weren't Christian that were living happy, fulfilling lives was like an inspiration to me of like, it's okay if I do this. Like at some point I can get to the other side of living this happy, fulfilled life without Christianity. And so, you know, with new friends I meet now, I am very open and I will say, hey, I don't, I'm not a Christian or I don't believe, or I usually stick with atheists. I like Phil's sentiment of, I don't really know. <laughs> and it doesn't really matter to me. But if someone asks, I'll, you know, pick an ist out of the <laughs> bucket and throw it out there and see how it goes but yeah there are a couple people in my life like I that I have not told um, like my parents my in-laws people that you know it sounds a little weird but I don't spend a lot of time with anymore because I'm halfway across the globe cool uh, Mika what has your experience been have you told the people in your life that you would consider closest where you are and if you have how long did you wait to make that conversation happen well first I like the I like the fact that Brandon that you dropped at the very end just a couple people I haven't told my parents mm -hmm. <laughs> just a couple yep, yeah just a few but not important people <laughs> you know that's a doozy um my kids are actually lost interest in church before I did because I was involved in choir and handbell <laughs> and those activities filled a need in me that had nothing to do with religion they were community activities they were music and I enjoyed it and I enjoyed the um status as well but Boy, when I left, nobody ever asked where I was. I mean, I, you know, I was so important in choir and hand bellow as such a, such a, <laughs> a gift, strong, useful member. And then crickets, you know, because so they, they know, they know they've lost you when you don't come back. Yeah. So that was, you know, COVID times is when, is when I finally quit. The kids had stopped going uh, before that and I, I didn't have the heart to make them. And I just followed them out. So that was easy, right? <laughs> I'm the one that struggled there. 
my former husband, I had pretty much wrecked our marriage by then by doing some extremely non-Christian things already. So I, t- <laughs> um, that really, the Christianity part was kind of secondary to that. So, and I was in an abusive alcoholic marriage for a long time. That was my way of ending it because he wouldn't leave. Mm-hmm. So I acted out and that worked. So I'm, I'm, I'm an open book with the exception of a couple of friends that just didn't feel, I felt like I wasn't invested enough in them to tell them because our entire friendship had been about the Christianity and there, and I didn't see them very much. It was kind of a, a non-issue. Um, but I never told my parents, my mom has passed away. And so there's only my dad and, um, I'm never going to tell him. Mm. There's a lot to unpack there. Like, I don't want to rabbit trail too much on it, but I find it really interesting that when you're talking about your marriage, you said that you stopped self, you kind of self-sabotaged it to, to get out of an abusive relationship. And to me, that says so much about that power dynamic that exists in an unhealthy relationship that is at one point was probably rooted in Christianity. For me, it was, yeah, I would married a person that I had doubts about because there was no going back. Because you see, we had had sex. Mm -hmm. Once you have sex, you can't go back. Right. You have to marry them now. Yeah. You've been one flesh. You've been deflowered. Yeah. Yeah, And, you know, and like I stayed married because I didn't want to disappoint my parents. That was one of the big things Mm -hmm. I didn't know. But I was secret. I've been secretive my entire life towards my parents. So this is no different. No different. Yeah. It's like saddening just because it'd be like the only way you could get out of an unhealthy relationship was for you to do something that for you was probably personally, you felt you were doing something wrong. It, no, when- I actually like I'm the only person on this goody two shoes pedestal <laughs> and everyone else is down here acting immoral and having a great time. So I just jumped off the pedestal yeah and my own choices well either way kudos i applaud you <laughs> yeah phil i realized that there are sins of pride and sins of, that of things that where you can't be generous and then there are sins of like passion and sex and cravings and i'm like i had indulged in a sin of pride for so long and i was like i'm gonna try these other <laughs> sins yeah. <laughs> yeah there's seven deadly ones like let me get buffet. yeah let me get a couple let me try these other ones out like that's funny <laughs> So I don't know if we've really talked about our stories, but Susie, we what, haven't. what's your, because yours has kind of been in flux a little bit. Like, where have you been in this yeah. journey? Have you had the conversation with your parents? And All right. Well, I guess I'll start with my husband. Oh, so. yeah. Start with husband. And then, yeah. yeah. Um, he's the first person I told. And I told him very shortly after that my shelf broke. We made an episode where I had like that list of childhood objections. And I actually wrote them all down for him, which is why I had them handy for the episode. I sat him down and he knew something was off with me like for weeks because um, I had been like buried in my phone listening to podcasts, reading Reddit <laughs> posts and, you know, reading up on philosophy and counter apologetics arguments and apologetics arguments. He knew something was up, but I think he thought I was cheating on him. <laughs> so I sat him down and I was like, I may have misrepresented myself when we got married, but I can't remember a time when I ever really, truly believed in God. And his mouth just dropped open. He was like, <laughs> what? He's probably like, oh, good. You're not cheating on me. That's the first thought. Maybe. He's like, I don't oh. know if he was relieved or not. <laughs> he was shocked. He just let me talk. I, I went through all my objections and I just explained to him how I felt. And I said, I don't want to go to church anymore. I'm not going to go to church except for baptisms and you know weddings and things like that. You can do whatever you want. I am not going to tell you what to believe, but I am not going to go back to church. And he said to me that he didn't think he could ever get to a place where he could say he didn't believe in God. And I was like, that's totally fine. You don't have to, that can be your place. And I, I won't tell the rest of his story because that's his story. But then I didn't want to tell my family for a very long time. So my son is 10 and confirmation class starts at what 13. And at the time he was eight when this happened. So I thought I had a good six years, five or six years. <laughs> but instead, we had a birthday party at my house and my mom started making disparaging comments about my best friend who I've mentioned before on, on this show. She's She just graduated and now she's a priest and she's a woman, obviously. And so this is like the worst thing you can do to my mother. <laughs> my best friend, she grew up with us and she was basically like my mother's fourth child. It just hurt me so much to hear my mom say these things about her. And so I defended her and I said, you don't do everything in the Bible either. Like you don't follow the Bible 100%. And she got like, oh, of course I do. What what are you talking about? And so then I started like, 
throwing off all the things that I had been learning about. And I said, you don't stone your rebellious children. There are so many things in the Bible that you would not condone. And she was so flabbergasted, <laughs> did not know how to reply. And we what? ended up in like probably an hour long conversation where everything kind of just spilled out. Mm -mm. At one point, she mentioned Noah's flood. And she was like, well, you know, what do you think about that? And I was like, well, mom, I don't actually think that happened. And she goes, what kind of Christian are you? And I didn't say anything. I didn't say, well, I'm not a Christian because I think that would have just killed her. And we were at a party and she was already crying. And this is also the same party where she said to me, you're asking dangerous questions to the wrong people. Mm -hmm. What? Uh, yeah. It's like all very CIA. It's like Christian CIA. <laughs> Very dangerous questions. Don't ask them. We're going to wind up manning a tower in Siberia. Yeah. I just want to know if your mom ever ate a shrimp. That's all I want to know. <laughs> right. Yes, she's eating shrimp. Yeah. Oh, God. Yes. And, she okay. doesn't, and she does not go outside in a tent during her period either. No. No. <laughs> right. So then um, I did not tell her at that party that I was not a Christian and that I didn't believe and that I was an atheist. But she texted me later that night and she said, so are you an atheist? And I did not want to say just yes, because it's a really loaded question. And I didn't want her to like shrivel up and die because that's what sh that's what would have happened if, she, if I had said yes. So I, I recorded um, like a 20 minute video of me just talking and telling her about all the doubts I'd had as um, a kid and how I even use this metaphor like, I always felt like you guys were on this like Christian speedboat and I was just <laughs> hanging off the back like in a life preserver, hanging <laughs> off for dear life so that I wouldn't get left behind. Mm -hmm. So I sent that to her instead. And I said, I don't like labels and I don't want, you know, I'm not an atheist, but I, I mean, I am, but I didn't <laughs> want her, I didn't want to use that word with her. And so that's how I, that's how I told them. And she's still not over it. Yeah. Ooh. That sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> Spicy, spicy. Yeah, spicy. It was, it was way spicier than I wanted. <laughs> it came out accidentally, and once it was out, you just can't put it back in. So yeah, you know, it's all going to come out. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. That that's you know the truth just kind of refuses to be put back in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mine, mine was somewhat accidental too. It was uh, New Year's Eve, and I get a text from my mom that says, "Heard you on a podcast." we're sorry that you're an atheist. And I was like, what the fuck? Like I had been on graceful atheist, you know, like, I don't know, a few months earlier telling my deconstruction story, blah, blah, blah. I hadn't told anybody. I didn't feel like I needed to, wasn't ready to, hadn't processed it. And so I was like, uh, pardon, like where, why would you say that? Blah, blah, blah. You know? And so I was kind of dumbfounded, didn't really address it that night. I responded with like something via the text saying, I don't know where you would get that from, but if you want to talk about it, we can talk about it, you know? So I just kind of left it that way. It was happy new year. <laughs> the next day I wrote like a very long, you know, detailed email and I sent it to my entire immediate family, my both parents and my, my adult sisters, you know, who are all very Christian. Everyone is still super Christian. You know, I was already kind of the black sheep of the family because I had gotten divorced. And to me, this was just like another, uh, oh, I'll feel fucked up, you know, <laughs> in their view. But I sent a very detailed, you know, thing saying, I don't want you to have the wrong impression of what atheist is or where I am, you know, so I, I laid it all out, you know, kind of in a, a written form. And I said, anytime you want to discuss this or have questions, I know this is going to be hard for you to read, but I'm here to answer any questions that you have. I don't expect you to accept it or condone it, but that's where I am and you can do with it whatever you want. And to this day, I have never heard a word from them about it, except for one call I had with my mom where she called to apologize about some shit <laughs> in my childhood. And we had a kind of a conversation, you know, where I kind of set some boundaries about like, don't send me Bible verses and stories about God being like a mother hen and shit like that. But yeah, that's kind of how it came out. And it was, I hadn't really decided if I was going to tell them at all or when yet. It just so I kind of just got forced into it, but I did feel immensely free <laughs> after it was out of the bag, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was, it was kind of nice. So yeah, it's interesting. Everybody's got kind of a different take on it. And I think, I guess everyone kind of covered this already, but like, were there specific motivating factors that, if you weren't forced into it, like like some of us were, that motivated you to tell your parents or not tell them? What were the thought processes that went behind? I've got to tell some people about this, or I'm not going to tell people about this. Let's go to Brianne. Sure. So like with my spouse, obviously, I was like, I cannot live day to day if I do not tell this person. So that was probably the biggest thing there. Um, qualms or anything with telling new people, I don't really have because I'm now like 
comfortable in where I'm at in deconstructing and saying I'm an atheist, which, you know, two years ago, I would have said, oh my gosh, what a heathen. <laughs> like, but now I'm comfortable doing that. So introducing to new people as atheists is fine. My So my parents are divorced. Um, I don't talk with my dad much. Um, so that's kind of like a non-starter. Um, if we were to chat, it wouldn't be about, hey, I'm an atheist. <laughs> um, it would be about a bunch of other stuff. For my mom, and I'm an only child as well. So like I'm like her pride and joy and like all of her hopes and dreams are just like vested in me, which is, you know, cool. No pressure. No pressure um, at all. <laughs> but for her, there was someone you had who does the humanize me podcast. Bart Campola. Yes. So I listened to that episode and I'm I'm also with I think both of you guys in struggling with how I feel about Christianity. So do I push like, hey, I think raising a child in Christianity is akin to child abuse, or do I kind of live and let live like the Bart Campolo mm -hmm. um, method? And I think a majority of the time I'm in the first column. But with someone like my mom, that episode really helped me process, like, I don't think I'm going to tell her and I don't want to tell her because just a variety of factors. Like, it is not at the point where I think she's causing harm by believing she's 60 plus years old. You know, she's here for this one life. And so if I'm going to hold the belief that this one life is all I have and I am making positive changes for me, who am I to tell her, hey, this is stupid and you shouldn't believe it. <laughs> and here's mm -hmm. all the reasons why. Like that just comes right. off a little not good to me. Yeah. Same with my in-laws. Um, my mother-in-law will send me like Instagram reels about Catholic Bible verses and Bible studies. And I just, I don't respond or I don't react. If she'll send me something that's not religious, I react. So maybe that hint is <laughs> getting through there. Um, but there just hasn't been a, a need for conversation. And I kind of hold the same viewpoint of with those people, I love them and I care about them. And so to some extent, I'm fine with them holding their beliefs because it's not really my place to tell them what their belief should be. If they want to have a conversation, I'm always open to it. But yeah, I think at some point, like if I told my mom, like Susie said, she would shrivel up and die and like have a heart attack. Like, so it is the best interest, I think, for those parties to remain in the dark about where I stand. Because ultimately, it, you know, I think this life is all you get. Their life is all they get. They, If they need to make it through however they need to make it through, who am I to yuck somebody's yum, I guess? Yeah, that's, I think, to met, to go back to the Bart Campolo episode. At first, Susie and I were like, oh, he makes some really good conversational points about how to like have the conversation. But then I think Susie and I kind of both are of the mind that like, we can't just let people wallow in this. Like, and I agree to a certain extent that there are some people, maybe a very few, that aren't hurting other people with their beliefs. Cause that's the, that seems to be like the argument that a lot of people say, well, I'm not hurting anybody by what I believe. But I always want to kind of stick my finger up and be like, well, I beg to differ. And then I kind of have a list of ways where I can guarantee that you're hurting someone. And, but they don't even realize it. Like, I guarantee you that the way my parents feel about LGBTQ people hurts a fuck ton of people. You're hurting people by your belief and you don't see that you're hurting people. So I think in those situations, there is a time to stand up. But that at the same time, you know your people the best. And you would also have to have the right motivation. And I think there's a fine line. If this person is trying to convert you or get you back and you're defending yourself and you're saying, I have good reasons for dropping this faith. There's a fine line between doing that and like not converting them or converting mm -hmm. yeah. them. Like I don't want to deconvert my parents either. They're in their seventies and it would just do no good to, to them or anyone else if they change the worldview right now. But if they come at me and say, you're going to hell because you don't believe this. I feel like I got to defend myself from that. Right. So it's a fine line. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And I think like, it's just my mom and it's just my in-laws and I don't want to, that to sound too diminishing, even though that is the kind of point of saying it's just my mom or <laughs> just my in-laws. They don't hold like the extreme toxic Christian views. And I honestly think my mom might be going through some sort of her own kind of change of belief. There have just been comments made over the past, you know, five, 10 years that have been like, oh, okay, like that's interesting coming from you. That's not what I would have expected. So there's potential for growth there. But again, it, I, I'm not not telling them to avoid like 
deconverting them. I guess there is kind of that fear of if I told my mom, I think she would react. First of all, if she survives, the reaction (laughs) would be, oh, well, I'm going to tell everybody at church and the church you go to and your youth pastor that taught you how to play in the worship band. And like it would just spiral into this thing of I would become in a prayer chain of things that I don't even want. And yeah, I don't know. So maybe it's a selfish reason that I don't want that to happen. I feel like it's really easy for me to say like it's not that hard to just not tell them because I don't see them. So that's kind of why I phrased it as I have the privilege of Mm -hmm. like, I don't have to interact with these people, which has made the deconstruction and deconversion easier for me, but also in terms of like needing to tell people is not, it's not a priority because I don't see them on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah. Lars, what about you? Like what were some of the motivating factors for you to tell? Yeah. I mean, for me, it was quite the opposite of that privilege that Brian was saying. I have regular contact with my family and in-laws, and um, we were actively involved in a church with people that I care about. I couldn't just go on pretending like, oh, I believe all this stuff. I'm honest to a fault almost. Um, I, you know, if I if I say something that I know isn't true, I get physically ill. I, I really, really don't like it. Uh, in fact, one of the biggest motivating factors for me to realize I had to come out at some point, first to my wife and family and then to my parents, was I was at, at my parents' place for Thanksgiving weekend and I was asked to say a prayer over lunch the day before Thanksgiving. Here we go. I, uh, I was... <laughs> I did it and I felt so bad. I was like, I can never do this again. Mm-hmm. This is the worst. Yeah. I felt like I just murdered someone or oh, like man. something like that. As my dad pointed out that he raised me to have integrity. So I do. And mm-hmm. so I'm not going to do that again. Um, and fortunately, you know, that was November of 2020 and uh, we worked this out in the end of June of 2021. And so we hadn't had a chance to see them again before that. And there was also enough time between that and the next time we were going to see them, which would have been Christmas, uh, for them to start processing the issue and not uh, explode in our face, which they didn't. So like I said, that part has actually gone relatively well. There's been the, the two really bad apologetics letters, but other than that, <laughs> it, it, the boat hasn't been rocked that much. Yeah, uh, I responded to the first one with like nine pages of <laughs> rebuttals explaining why not only are these Classic. bad arguments, but they know they're bad because they taught them to me themselves when I was a kid. Right. So it's not like I wasn't aware of them. Yeah. I did not bother responding to this latest one because uh, right at the same time I got it, my mom was diagnosed with cancer and there's just, there's too much going on there. I don't want to ruin their already bad time yeah. with even harsher words. And it's also clear that they don't really respect my opinion on it. They, I have to be the way they want me to, or they just aren't going to respect it. And since I don't really want to take away what they see as their only hope in these waning years of life. Uh, there's just no point in, in continuing to respond if they're not going to actually take me seriously. Yeah. I also should mention uh, that or shortly after uh, we came out to our family, we were interviewed on the Graceful Atheist podcast that Phil has also been on. And then I used that a couple months later as a uh, kind of a springboard to make a public post on Facebook announcing to the world that I was no longer a Christian because, again, I crave authenticity and integrity and cannot just keep pretending to believe things I don't believe. And I'd rather not have incorrect assumptions between me and my friends and family who might not have heard already. So now again, that may not be for everybody. I happen to be a fairly upfront and in your face kind of person. Yes, that means I'm perhaps a bit rude sometimes, but (laughs) I'd rather do that and maintain integrity uh, as I feel it than dance around the issue. On the other hand, if, as Brianne, you said, uh, and Mickey, you too, like there are some people where there's just not a great reason to tell them and not enough opportunity for it to become a big problem. They don't need to know. It's your business and yours alone. So it's just really a matter of how you present to other people and how they interact with you and and how you assess that and value that interaction. That's really the factors that you have to consider when you're deciding whether or not to come out and how to do it. I think we can probably all agree though, that you know, going over to someone's house and saying, hey, sit down, I got to tell you that the, everything you believed is stupid and foolish. And <laughs> I think you're a bad person for it. It's probably not the best way to go. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, Lars, is that Facebook post that you were talking about, is that public? Yes, it is public. Yeah, okay, you're welcome good. to share it with anyone who wants to read it and see the kind it's of It's fantastic. Oh, yeah. It's a very, I mean, there's lots of responses on there from lots of different people. Mm-hmm. I mean, some supportive, some argumentative. And mm-hmm. it's very fun watching you interact with these people. So I recommend everybody go to Lars his profile and look at that post yeah the very worst ones are the ones from people who uh encountered 
my responses in creationism or theism debate groups and then came to my profile to see what sort of a heathen would be making these horrible uh, uh <laughs> as they saw it horrible statements um and then of course they're like aha you were never a real christian you've <laughs> fallen away <laughs> you now, repent while there's still a chance like, yeah I gotta say, man, telling me that if you break it down, you're really basically telling me to worship your infinitely evil God that I don't think is real. It's just not the sales pitch you seem to think it is. Right. <laughs> what about uh, you, Mika? What is you, what were some of the motivating factors for your decision to tell or not tell? So first of all, I want to say this group right here just demonstrates what I know to be true, which is when you hatch out of Christianity, you're hatching out of a belief system with your full moral compass intact. And I say a lot of spiritual gifts, okay? Because you actually, spiritual gifts are not limited to Christianity. You means any human can develop gifts like empathy and kindness and long suffering and love and, and charity. And those are obviously active in your lives. Yeah. It's very apt to me. Um, and me too. And I feel that I feel that we're I agree with the person that said we're grad graduates of this. <laughs> um, we don't need oh, those yeah. to live in this way. And it's wonderful. And so when I talk to former Christians, that is the universal experience that I've had. And I've talked to so many. I've got a lot of young former Christians who I have spoken to over these years and kind of given support to because I have a um, background in case management. It just kind of comes naturally to me. And I just find it to be true about us as ex-Christians. So I just want to get that out of the way. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Um, wow. So, and as for me at age 45 now, you can't just have access to me to my truth, my heart, just because you want it. If I don't want to tell you something about me, then I don't have to. And that's something I had to decondition myself out of being in the habit of, you know, whatever you demand from me, I have to tell you. Right. Because the power differential of being a woman and having a man like my dad interrogate me, I'm just not going to put myself in a position like that. No one gets to drag the truth out of me or interrogate me or kind of put me on trial. So that's what number one. So initially, not telling was just fear-based. I didn't want to be judged. I didn't want to hear the horrible, harsh things my parents would say to me because I'm also an only child and I don't have any siblings to shelter me from harshness. And I don't want to have that experience, really. I don't feel like I've done anything to deserve it. And also, for a long time, I was like, <laughs> they raised me authoritarian. They threatened to cut off my college education if I didn't go to church. They kind of forced me to feel like I needed to get married to this guy who turned out to be an alcoholic, which I couldn't tell them about. And so I'm not going to out myself because I want to inherit the house. <laughs> I don't want to be disinherited. Yeah. I want coming to me. And I was pretty like that for a couple of years. But now... <laughs> That really doesn't matter to me so much. What really matters to me is that my dad has a very fragile ecosystem emotionally and spiritually, and I cannot be the reason why it cracks. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's 73. My mom died recently after a very long period of being immobilized in the home, which he took care of her for 10 years. That's a whole other story. Um, like I said, they had a very strange cult and she actually took to the bed for religious reasons 10 years ago, not physical reasons. Wow. Interesting. And she was full total care wow. for 10 years. She died. Mm -hmm. So she just withered away in the bed of basically of her she, own volition. Volition. She, did. she will. She willed it. Yes. That's. Mm -hmm. well, I don't even know I what to I, like. I don't even I don't know, know what, what to, to ask. Say. Yeah, yeah like, I can't even imagine. The, I'm speechless. Yeah, the thing that jumps out to me about what you're saying, and the true, the, uh, this is kind of true for everybody, is what I see from the decisions to to share or not to share is the amount of like thought and heart and empathy that goes into that decision is so much greater than any empathy or love that I've seen, you know, Christ-like, I'm using the air quotes again, Christ-like love that supposedly Christians have. I see it more yes. in the atheist, humanist, ex-Christian community than I ever saw in the church. Yes, it's graduate. Yeah, and that graduation is a great way to say, it's like, I learned a bunch of shit down here. It's kind of like my actual college degree. I don't use it now because it's worthless. <laughs> You know, right, because, learn how to do it. but it taught you how to think. Yeah, it taught me some yeah. things, you know, but I'm past that now. You know, it's uh, it's funny because I'm now thinking of a Bible verse that says, you know, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I spoke like a child. And now 
I'm an adult and I'm a man or a woman and I'm going to think and act like a man or a woman, you know, and that's, I think that's really what, <laughs> that's what this looks like. This is like a bunch of men and women who've grown up and said, I'm not going to just believe this milky shit <laughs> that you're trying to force down my throat. I'm going to think for myself, but it's, with, it's, my but it's and tear into it. <laughs> yeah. And it, but it's all done with like this empathic response because if the shoe's on the other foot, which it is like with most of our parents or whatever, like my parents are still like diehard Christians, but they think that they're right and I'm wrong and that it's their job to save me. And they think that that's love. Whereas I am not going to push what I don't believe anymore on them. And at, literally none of us have said, I don't think it's my job to like tell my parents what to think or believe or whatever. Let them figure they're fucking adults or they're too <laughs> fragile <laughs> to even like deal with my adulthood you know which is I, I don't know it's just interesting like yeah yes it's true oh uh, Susie what have been some of the motivating factors behind you sharing even though you kind of got forced into yeah. it too like I did to continue to engage or not engage what is kind of your motivating factors well, behind that yeah the motivating factor for telling my husband is because he's my husband and I live with them and I've never kept anything from him before. And so I had to be genuine with him or it wouldn't have worked. I did not want to tell my family because I did not want them to be disappointed in me. And this is something that I've dealt with my whole life where basically every decision I made has been in light of would this disappoint my parents? And I'm still, I still kind of do that. I don't know if anybody's ever read the book, uh, Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents. It's in my Amazon cart as we speak. It's it's real good and it's real, tr it's real triggering. So get ready. But this is what we have to do now. Like we're the adults. It's sad on some level that now as grown ass people, we have to like tiptoe around our parents. You know, sometimes it's for fear of disappointment. Sometimes it's because we know they can't handle it. Phil. It feels good to know why we're doing it, though, instead yeah. of being active. Yeah, exactly. Inside ourselves. It's like, this is why I do this and I'm okay with it. Yeah. And the thing I always think about, and I've, I've talked to Susie about this, like in our own conversations, like the reason I finally like really went out and put it on my public Facebook page and did a thing like that was because like, I decided for myself, well, I want to be genuine, kind of like Lars said, like I have this high drive for ethical integrity and I don't want to have to pretend to be someone else to any facet of my life. And I had to remind myself, that's you. When I'm talking to Susie, that's not her. Like she's not at that point yet. And you ha and that's the thing, you know, that like Dave talks about on Graceful Atheist, that is grace. That's real grace. Like where you give someone permission to live the life that they want to live, not the one that you want them to live that you think is the best for them. Like that's a hard thing to learn. We're better at it than the God that they told us about. <laughs> right. <laughs> race than he ever was yeah exactly yeah just something I've, that i've really been thinking about lately is just how infantilizing many religions and especially christianity in our case are you know when adult anything is considered off limits right you know i don't know if any of us were raised with the um, advice from train up a child by uh the pearls uh <laughs> but it, it's like an extreme version of fundamentalist parenting uh but the general idea is that kids are born with a spirit of rebellion you have to mm -hmm. break it out of them and make it so that they only listen to your words i mean there's a whole host of bad assumptions in that but the ma major ones are one that basically all humans are born as myopic psychopaths two that uh, somehow becoming a parent magically frees you from this and makes your wisdom infallible right <laughs> oh and interesting really, yeah the major goal of parenting should be to raise a competent adult right so you mm -hmm. go from helpless baby to competent adult and mm -hmm. that means <laughs> stop treating them like a helpless baby when they're not a helpless baby anymore right but you know if you assume that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it or that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god well then you're not going to let them learn how to trust themselves ever or right. you know trust in yahweh with all your heart and do not lean in your understanding right it, it it basically makes it so that you are unable to make decisions you're not equipped to make adult decisions right or when you are an adult and are trying to follow god you're just going to go based on well what you call you might call it the holy spirit but really it's just an emotional urge that may not really be based on anything mm -hmm. and so maybe you'll oh i don't know take your young family to live in another country for a few years and try to preach the gospel to people who are already Christians, but just not the right kind of Christians. <laughs> yeah. Guess where I got that story from? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, 
when you're talking about the suppression of your natural ability to develop yourself as a person and make cognitive leaps and sort mm -hmm. of become a fully functioning adult, intuition is what is suppressed. Mm -hmm. Intuition yeah. is what causes us to question what we're told and to move beyond it and to discard the parts we don't like. Or, or even rational thought. Because like for me, evolution was the big deal, right? That's right. rational scientific stuff. It's both. It's anything that isn't religious thought. Mm -hmm. They both have a very specific purpose in our development. Intuition keeps us safe. Uh, mm -hmm. Tells us to go down that street or, you know, go into that dark room, <laughs> whatever. Right. Or, you know, and when you suppress them, then that is infantilizing of the person. And, and when I got my intuition back, that's my Holy Spirit. That's <laughs> my guiding Holy Spirit is my inner voice telling me what's right and wrong. Yeah, I got it. But it's, it has nothing to do with the Bible. It has nothing to do with that God. It's mine. Right. I got it back. It's like a it's a wonderful feeling. It's, it's like, mm -hmm. yes, I'm protecting myself now. I am my parents. Yeah. yeah. I am my parents. I like that. Yeah. As my wife put it on, on the night that we first discussed that we didn't believe anymore, I finally feel like myself. And I mm. thought that was a really great way to put it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if any of you guys have watched Shiny Happy People about the Duggars, you know, <laughs> and IBLP and Ooh, Bill Gothard, and they talk about the pearls in there. And they talk really heavily about how all of it is based in authority. And they talk about the child training and blanket training, which for those of you who know what that is, it's like the most <laughs> damaging thing you could ever imagine to, to the way to parent a child. But it's it's all about authority. And so in that documentary, you know, Jim Bob Duggar, which I can't even say that without like wanting to vomit, but like, like <laughs> he, he said, he actually told his like kids, he goes, it doesn't matter how many cameras they put in this house. They'll never know how we actually treat these kids because those kids were so afraid to step out of line because of the authority structure that they put in place. And I can attest to what that authority structure feels like. Like, you're not going to fuck up in certain situations, you know, because you know that someone's watching. You know, I was a preacher's kid, so I know what's riding on my behavior. When you're treated like that your entire life, and like Lars was saying, that switch doesn't magically go off now that you're an adult. But And then you have a kid and then you're like, well, I'm going to raise my kid the same exact way because I don't know any other way to do it. Yeah. Another good resource. I don't know if you guys have read this is You Are Your Own by Jamie Lee Finch. Has anybody read that one? She talks a lot about when you said I am my parent. She talks a lot about that kind of in a different way, like the way you take ownership of your own body and reconnect with your body as a person as she calls it a she because she's a she so she says you know i talk to my body and i tell her things you know because it's now my job to parent my own self as opposed to being parented so or as opposed to outsourcing it to some spirit in the sky right <laughs> that lives so far away and and will never be here i'm not outsourcing that responsibility anymore yeah exactly Overall, how has your experience been with sharing with your family? Talk a little bit about some of the experiences you've had. Like after you told them, how has it affected your current relationships? Like since since you have told the people that you have told. Uh, let's go to let's go to Brianne. Well, for people I have told, like with my spouse, honestly, it's been a very positive experience of being able to share that with someone that you know I'm expecting to spend a lot of time with. I think it's been neat because we do have the opportunity. We're living in a different country. And now part of our experience is, you know, in Japan, there's a lot of Buddhist and Shinto shrines. And so we're able to go to these, you know, Shinto shrines or these Buddhist shrines. And I don't have this overwhelming, like, oh my gosh, this is evil. Right. Like, what am I doing here? Because I have heard that from people you know, even here of someone who, you know, has identified as Christian and said, you know, hey, it really wasn't for me going out and experiencing this shrine because I felt an overwhelming evil spirit there. And I'm like, <laughs> well, did you actually feel that or were you conditioned your entire life to view that as evil? And so now it's just, you know, a very positive, you know, I'm with someone who knows my feelings on it. But now I think that's allowing us both to go out into the world and like just genuinely experience humanity and like cool things and not have this 
gross or icky religious connotation under anything that I'm not a spiritual warrior, you know, <laughs> I don't need to go to these like Shinto shrines and try to in broken Japanese communicate with these people that they're wrong about something like, whereas that very much like would have been my belief five, 10 years ago, like, and it's just nice to have the world be opened up in such a positive way and be allowed to experience things. Telling new people as I'm approaching 30, um, I'm really excited because now I'm like, okay, I'm a bona fide adult almost. Um, <laughs> and you know, you can make adult friendships, I think, easier. And I think I've just allowing myself to grow through the deconstructing while also growing up yeah. has made me realize who I am as a person and what I want out of life and what I want to invest in relationships and friendships and things. So that's been a really positive step forward. And, you know, I always go back to, and I wanted to bring this up of like a big thing while my shelf was collapsing, so to say, <laughs> was I started reading The God Delusion, but the new preface of this book, Richard Dawkins, he says a quote, in it that I have highlighted and underlined so many times because it hit me like a bus and it was, <laughs> I hope whoever reads this book doesn't say I didn't know I could of just access, you know, the book. And that hit me like a, a truck because, mm. you know, as I'm growing up religious, if I would have checked out the God delusion from the library and I was still living with my mom, that would have been like a huge red flag and she would have gone off the deep end and, right. you know, reamed into me. So the sentence of, I don't want someone to say, I didn't know I could, that stuck with me. And so that was kind of the, how I approached, you know, decon conversion going forward. So I apply that to my life experiences now of like, I can do whatever and experience all this short time here that I can and not have to feel like immense amounts of guilt and shame or, you know, responsibility for other people's souls. And that has just been so freeing. Yeah, I think you make a, a good point because I think the the idea of growth it's not really possible when you're stuck in Christianity because the growth is limited to one sphere that turns out to be fictional. Uh, Lars, what about you? How is it received kind of from your, let's not talk about so much your like wife and immediate family. Let's what yeah. about like your parents and other people in your life that you told about? Well, I, I'm, like I said, I mentioned my par parents. Um, I know that they are not happy. They have let me know that they've cried themselves to sleep over it sometimes. And that's exactly what I expected. Um, <laughs> but you know, as I've come to realize, that's their feelings and how they respond to it. And if I'm going to be a person of integrity to them, I'm not going to pretend that I share beliefs that I don't share. The most interesting interaction I've had uh, with family since that is my oldest sister over Thanksgiving last year. She took me aside and started, to, or not so, took me aside, but uh, when we had an <laughs> opportunity to talk, she started asking me about why I didn't believe. And I'm like, because I don't think it's real. And <laughs> good enough answer. She's not dumb. She is, she is also quite intelligent and she understands that that is a reason, but I think she doesn't really believe it. I think she thinks there's still some emotional thing there that's keeping her from being Christian that, oh, you know, maybe if I just hadn't had the strict Christianity that I was raised with, that I could still believe. And it reminds me that it's really hard to help someone who does not, or who is stuck in religion, to understand that those who don't think it's true, genuinely, truly, completely don't think it's true to the same level and for the same reason, they don't think Santa Claus is real. In fact, I gave that as an analogy at one point. And she's like, oh, how could you put God on the same level as Santa Claus? Because <laughs> they have the same level of proof. Yeah. They have the same level, right? They both, you know, they see you while you're sleeping and know when you're awake and know if you've been bad or good. So you better be good for, in this case, Yahweh's sake. But I don't really <laughs> care <laughs> because unless Yahweh shows up and does something, I don't think he's real. And I can't have a relationship with him because my sister was also like, well, isn't part of being good having a right relationship with people? Yes, it is. And if God wants a relationship with me, he is omnipotent, he is omniscient, and therefore, and he knows exactly what to do and can do it with minimal effort, make it so that I know of him with perfect clarity. At that point, then I would in fact have a choice of whether or not to follow his religion and do what he wants or not. But then it would I would have made a choice. Then I could right. be, if I was going to judge me on what choices I've made, he could judge me on that. But as it stands, I cannot justly judge for unbelief because I know way more about it than she does. And I'm still quite convinced that it's not true. Yeah. You know, but that was an interesting reaction. And she is mature enough to be able to say, hey, you know what? I disagree. This is not a fun conversation, but I still love you and care about you and even like you. And I feel <laughs> the same about her. 
not all Christians are so understanding or able to actually have a whole conversation. And yeah. she was even listening to what I was saying, um, you know, and not just pivoting to the next question when I shot the first one down. I would love to have more relationships and interactions like that. But unfortunately, she's the only one I've had so far with my Christian friends and family. I should also mention uh, my pastor um, of the church that I was going to. Uh, I still hold a lot of respect for him. He's a very smart guy, a very good guy, and does a lot to actually make sure that the church that he helps run does good in the world. And shortly after we left the church, we had a long conversation uh, with him and another one of the elders about, you know, why we didn't believe anymore. And it was amicable and interesting. And they actually listened to us and we actually listened to them. So you can have good relationships and good conversations with people who still believe, even when they are specifically talking about why you don't believe anymore. Mm -hmm. I hesitate to, say, hesitate to say a lack of belief because I don't consider a lack to lose something that's bad. Um, I think <laughs> of faith as belief, you know, without regard for the truth. It's believing in the absence or face of evidence. And so to me, at least that seems to be a bit of a moral failure, but not everyone sees it that way. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, as far as reactions go, like I said, if you look at that public Facebook post, it's quite a trip. You've got every, everything from supportive former believers, supportive Christians to people saying, oh, I think you're being a bit bullying, who <laughs> are themselves not Christians. Hey, it's a fair concern. If I am doing that, I don't want to. So I, I do take it seriously if someone tells me that. Um, I, I don't think it's a fair criticism. But you know, I do want to know if I'm coming across as just bullying as opposed to actually engaging in real conversation. Well, that's no good either. Then I'm not being more ethical, right? Yeah. You know, there's also, like I said, the loons who jump on there who have engaged with me in other groups. And because it's a public post, they can feel free to comment on it. And they mm -hmm. say some really bonkers stuff. <laughs> and I realize not all Christians think as they do, but it does remind me of how I could never possibly become a Christian again. Because in order for me to be a Christian, you have to convince me of two things. One, that it's true. Two, that it's good. And it's neither. And it's really easily demonstrably neither one of those things. <laughs> so sorry, Christians, I'm just not going to become a Christian again. I guess you could say that, you know, I'm like one of those people um, who has tasted the good, th the Holy Spirit and fallen away and can never again be renewed to repentance. And you know what? I don't care. Let me just go on the record and saying, I deny and blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Just for the record. <laughs> just for the record. Bla you heard it here first, but you won't, it won't be the last time you'll hear Lars blaspheme oh, someone who Lars, doesn't exist. You just screwed yourself. Yeah. Watch out for the lightning. You can't lightning. ever go back. The lightning is going to hit that nice upholstery. You better watch out. Well, fortunately, it's not mine. This is a, this is a rental house. Yeah, it's a rental. Renting. It's covered by the cleaning <laughs> fee. Even divine retribution is covered by the cleaning fee. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, well, we, we've been chatting for a while, but let's talk about a little bit kind of to wrap this up. Like, what are some advice or tips or I don't know, tips and advice seems like really cliche, but like, wh what's something that you would tell someone who's like maybe on the verge of having this conversation with a someone that they care about deeply? What's something that you might tell them as they're preparing for it? Like, what's something to do? What's something not to do? Mika, what's your thoughts on this? Don't take any actions before you've had a chance to really think the moves out like a chess game several in advance. Especially when it comes to what could happen with the severance of relationships, uh, make sure that you're not financially dependent on someone before you drop it. You know, the authoritarianism creates dependency mm -hmm. and especially in children. Um, there are so many things that can be withheld from you if you're still a dependent. So make sure you're not in an, a vulnerable position uh, when you're when you're telling your truth. Um, and I actually wanted to say something about what it was like to be open about not being a Christian anymore. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, on my page, it's not a public page. But Phil, can you attest that I go to town on Jehovah on the regular on my oh, page? Yeah. yeah, she does. It's, <laughs> it's awesome. Him, tear him a new one on the regular. Um, and the most reactions I get are from pagans who are just as invested in a father God as Christians are, which is why uh, paganism was just a little taste for me. And I was like, wow, y'all are so into God. <laughs> y'all are so into the God in the sky. I can't hang with this. Yeah. But um, And also uh, new age people uh, are often invested in that father God in the sky, which I find really strange. And I find to be a, just a pervasive need for this surveillance figure and this this detached figure and 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 so many new age uh thoughts and beliefs are about transcending and leaving your body and leaving your you know leaving the earth and not caring about what goes on down here at all and and that is exactly what they teach you when you're when you're a christian is that the things uh, here don't matter at all but they do we live here right now <laughs> right 
try it now. I, I assure you that they matter to me. So um, as a creature who lives here, it's important yeah. um, that, you, that you not outsource your spiritual self to something uh, who doesn't live here at all. And doesn't demonstrably exist. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and doesn't seem to give a shit about us either. So right. in fact, um, it just kind of spurs me on to deconstruct the god the father god even more and just be even nastier so if you want want to see some nasty stuff i have a special blog about (laughs) yeah yeah me and me and mecca were talking a bunch today and she was i was like hey can you give me some resources on this and then she's like stand by and then it was like uh like just a blast (laughs) of books and i was like sweet hold on let me screen like i got them all like in my saved in the chat there um so yeah if you want to get some education on on patriarchal structures and all that uh mika is your is your source so we're gonna have you come on another time and talk about that stuff too but but yeah do you have any other thoughts about advice to someone who's on the cusp don't be afraid to someday revisit and take your gifts with you that you got take your prizes with you reality for you again no one can ever tell you what's right and wrong again you are the authority take it with you yeah Mm -hmm. yeah that's a good point about gifts too kind of like you think about all the things that you might have actually learned about yourself as a christian some of those things are actually useful not because they came from god but because they came from you (laughs) like because you studied and tried your best to conform yourself to this esoteric path called Christianity, you actually might have learned a few things about yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes, that study does. Yeah. Brianne, what are some of your thoughts? Yeah, I think like in my case, it's 50-50 and it's entirely up to you. I think the safety aspect and like dependency aspect is a really good thing to note of hey, if this is going to cause financial or hostile living situations, there are other factors that you need to consider. But if you are, you know, someone on their own experiencing the world, you maybe have your own family, just know that you can. You can question things. Wherever you're at on that deconstructing or deconversion journey, it is entirely up to you. I saw a TikTok that I found funny of this guy was joking that, hey, life is a lot more fun when you realize it's an open world sim and you can do whatever you want. And while I think that there's some implications there of obviously you can't do everything, (laughs) <laughs> it it is like I, I now adhere to the belief this is the one life that i have so make the most of it you know if you have relationships that you are invested in and that you hold to a high degree and that it would strengthen that relationship or even if it damages the relationship are you okay with that person not seeing your true self? Uh, much like Lars said, like living in integrity and who have you invested in? Who are you going to continue to invest in? And I like that, you know, you can revisit, like Mika said, like it's an open world sim, play it how you want, make sure your safety's first. You know, if you're thinking about telling people I really liked Lars's letter idea, because, you know, that does show care, that shows kindness, that shows grace, that shows that you are taking time and that you value that person. If it is a more casual relationship, you can obviously, you know, maybe go out to coffee and, you know, say that way. I think it depends on your personal relationships and how you interface with people. But there are tons of people that have done what you are thinking about doing. Your mileage may vary, (laughs) but um, I think what we've seen here is it is rewarding to share with those closest to you. And that biggest thing of all is, you know, we see grace on the other side. And there's hope there. Like Lars was saying, he thinks he's rude for, you know, he's harsh to a point and he's too rude. But like you postponed doing this like really big life changing conversation because you wanted to make sure people had a good time on their cruise. That's so kind and heartfelt and like full of grace that I just admire. And, you know, put yourself out there, surround yourself with other people of similar and different mindsets and see that, you know, wherever you go, there are kind people and there is grace. It's not just in a Christian church. Yeah. And that's really important. Real good advice. I think the whole thing of like that, it's your decision. That's a hard thing to kind of get a hold of when you're going through this journey. Cause you've been told your whole life that nothing is your decision. You are in control of your for lack of anything better, destiny of what you want to do. It's your choice. You can you can basically do whatever you want. I like the open world sim idea. <laughs> it's like a good way to think about it. It's like you just go in there and build whatever the hell you want. Lars, what are your uh, 
your thoughts about advice and tips and do's and do nots yeah. maybe yeah well i mean uh Mika and brianna have already given a lot of good ideas you know don't don't jeopardize yourself but i think i mentioned earlier remember that your response to your feelings is your responsibility and the same goes for whoever you tell if you know that they're going to be sad take that into account but remember that it is up to them how they handle that and so if they're going to be sad that you're not a believer anymore but you're going to be miserable pretending to be one around them well consider what you value more i'm not going to say you have to value one over the other but your values are yours now it's not dictated to you by the bible which let's face it doesn't have great values um <laughs> but <laughs> When one of the things that has helped me to make choices as a mature adult or a maturing adult is to look at what other people have done, right? When we're, I was growing up, there are all kinds of things that were way off limits because they were quote unquote sin, which I've come to realize is just sin is doing something that God doesn't like. And if a God's not real, I don't care. But why do people do the things that they do? Most of the time, it's not because they're evil and trying to hurt others and destroy society. Most of the time, it's because they feel like doing them. <laughs> You can look at them independently of that. Look at why do people eat certain foods or take certain substances or have certain kinds of relationships with certain people? Do they have good reasons or bad reasons? And hey, maybe some of the things that you were told as a Christian are okay. Obviously, you can't stick around for 2,000 years and be completely off base with how to live life. Some of the ideas work, some of them don't, but you can evaluate them individually and Again, as I mentioned earlier, it's also your business. So let's say you decided to try some substance that was forbidden to you as a Christian. You don't have to tell anybody. <laughs> never. You're I'm not going to know. The horror. <laughs> I know. So if you realize, hey, I actually like beer or something else, then your Baptist friends don't need to know that you like beer now. But on the other hand, you know, letting them know that at least you don't believe in their God when next time they ask you to pray over the meal. Well, again, it's your choice, whichever, you, whatever you value more, act on your values, act with care and respect to other people, as opposed to respect for a God who isn't there. And I can almost guarantee you'll, you personally, at least will feel better about the outcome, even if it's a bit harsh, like, you know, my, you know, my parents have cried themselves to sleep. And my sister was very upset to hear that I never thought Jesus was all that great to begin with. <laughs> but I still felt better saying it with integrity than right. I ever did starting a prayer with dear Lord, when I never felt God was very dear to me. Right. So, you know, I don't know if it's really so much advice is just on how to come out as it is about how to make choices now that you don't have them dictated to you anymore. Yeah. Good thoughts. Susie, you have any thoughts or? Oh, I don't really know how much I can add to that. I think they covered it pretty well in the interest of time. I'm only going to say that it might be useful if you're not ready to tell people that you don't believe anymore and people are asking questions about like where your faith is at or if you're going to church or whatever. It's okay to just say, I'm asking questions or I'm just studying. I'm doing some studying. If anybody is going to tell you that, oh, you can't be asking questions. I don't think anybody really wants to admit that. Right. I mean, I'm pretty sure that my mom, she would not want me asking questions, but how bad does it sound for her to say, you can't be asking questions. Right. And so I think that if you just say like, I'm asking questions, nobody's going to push back on that. And it's something safe that you can say, or you don't have to give them the whole truth. You can reserve a little bit of that for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I think it goes to the idea of like, setting boundaries which again is a hard thing to do because we haven't been taught how to do that either <laughs> so you know yeah. it, one of the things i think is very important if you do decide to make this decision is think out a few moves ahead think about the consequences but then also be prepared to set a firm boundary and a boundary is completely worthless if you don't enforce it like if your parents are in trying to indoctrinate your kids you have to set the boundary and say hey you can't do that around my kids and then you have to be willing to follow through with it you know so like my mom was sending me you know these videos and songs and whatever and i was like okay you have to stop doing that if you if you do that this is what i will do in response i've only gotten one since then <laughs> you know there is good things that come from setting boundaries and they're hard to do but you will benefit from them I really appreciate all of you guys being on here. It's been really awesome and enlightening to hear all of your stories. Just the amount of wisdom that's kind of conglomerated <laughs> like here, I think is really cool. And like, and I just love that it's coming from so many different angles. And just the way that everybody was able to spin their words so cleverly and differently from one another, it hits you in a different way. And I think that's really important for people to hear. So yeah. thank you so much for being on. 
Yeah, thank you guys for having us. And I think I won't speak for everybody, but, you know, podcasts like this helped me through my deconversion and deconstruction. You know, whether that's, you know, Graceful Atheist, I listened to Born Again Again, and then I caught this one right at the start. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to be a from the start listener. Nice. Um, <laughs> you know, these help. It does matter. There is someone out there that didn't know they could have questions. Mm hmm. And whoever that reaches at whatever time, it, it's making a difference. Yes, thanks again. I'm, I really feel honored to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Flawed Theology Podcast. I'm Phil. And I'm Susie. Tune in next time where we will continue to tackle the question, if your theology were wrong, wouldn't you want to know? Be sure to join us on our Facebook group, Dangerous Questions, and follow us at flawedtheologypodcast.com. Subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Rate and review the podcast on Google, Spotify, Apple. Those uh, reviews are really cool and we like to hear from them. So until next time, keep asking the dangerous questions. See you next time.